Good morning. I realize that some of you may be tuning in from uh, other parts of the world, so uh, it, it may be another time of day. But regardless, thank you for uh, joining me this morning. Um, apologies for the um, technical delay. Um, so uh, this morning, um, I'm going to try to introduce you to a very timely topic. Um, there are many challenges we face these days, and I can't imagine what many of you on this um, webinar are thinking about your upcoming uh, school year for those of you who are school-based personnel, or for everyone, uh, just because we, we still have unknown challenges before us. So I wish everyone um, well. I'm trying to uh, bring up the slides um, on my other machine here so I can take a look at those. Um, and uh, it looks like I have them now. Good. Um, so I want to acknowledge on the first slide uh, my conflict of interest in, um, in this work. I've been working on this with Cecil Reynolds since essentially 1986. And um, we long ago had the idea to try to uh, create a screener for both mental health disorders and mental health risk. Um, and that um, was finally realized in the, in the form of the best. So uh, these are your learning objectives uh, for the day here on the second slide. Um, and they include uh, understanding epidemiology, uh, basic principles of university universal screening, content validity, um, consistency, and other validity indexes, how to triage students for preventive interventions, and use of our uh, behavioral and emotional skill building guide. I'm going to spend less time this morning on technical issues, such as reliability and validity and theory, uh, because I suspect that many individuals who are part of this presentation this morning um, just want to get to work and want to do the best they can for children. And they want to see if, um, if the work that we're talking about this morning has the potential to do that. So that's going to be my focus. And if we do have time for questions at the end, I'll be happy to field more technical questions. So prevalence of risk. And this is uh, where uh, Cecil Reynolds and I started um, with the development of, of screeners. We started with an Institute of Education Sciences grant uh, worked with our colleagues, uh, Christine Stefano, Aaron Doughty, many of our former students on this work, uh, Bridget Dever at Lehigh, et cetera. And um, they've been refining this for a couple of decades now. But our, our work was, um, uh, was created because of the extraordinary epidemiology. Uh, I work in higher education now, um, and in higher education, we're seeing the epidemiology increase as well. Um, and, um, internalizing problems such as depression, anxiety, and um, because of our current stresses um, uh, locally, uh, nationally, and internationally, that's even more so. So um, estimates, and these are old estimates um, from a few years ago by the Centers for Disease Control, um, we're about 20% uh, of school-aged children, according to that uh, sort of landmark um, morbidity and mortality report uh, that you can get from CDC um, have a diagnosable condition. That's important. Uh, it's a big number. And it's a worrisome number. But in addition to that, there's another group of children um, and adolescents um, and young adults, for that matter, who are this this far or this far beneath the DSM um, OCD or other diagnostic threshold. And these are the children and adolescents that I worry about. These are the children and adolescents that I hope we can identify with what um, Dennis Cantwell has called historically subsyndromal psychopathology, or what I call behavioral and emotional risk. So they're one or two or three symptoms short of having a diagnosable condition. This makes this group uh, not only worrisome, but also um, the, the the children and adolescents that we should target for preventive uh, stra intervention strategies so that we can prevent risk from becoming disorder. So just like um, um, individuals like myself who gets my cholesterol checked every year, um, um, that's, a, that's a risk factor for uh, cardiovascular disease. 
and my internist is testing for that risk factor um, to see how close I am to having a diagnosable condition um, such as uh, cardiac disease. And what he uh, does, as he does with many adults, is if you're close to having problems or showing more risk, uh, your internist tries to mitigate that risk with their own intervention. Uh, and in the case of many of us, it's going to be a statin medication, right? So, um, so this logic of early identification of risk, of identifying kids without disorders, but have risk directly analogous to public health work um, and to work uh, that physicians have been engaged in um, forever. Um, so that's what we're trying to do here. Um, we, we will with universal screening, identify kids who have disorders. And we'll identify kids with disorders, as you see on this next slide, who have are just unknown to us. So we'll, we'll catch those kids. Um, and many of those kids will already be, already be receiving services. As you see in this slide, many will not, uh, because um, the, the visual test or the informal test of mental health diagnosis is just not very accurate. And so we see kids that look sad who are not depressed, and we see kids who look happy and are depressed. And, and so those methods uh, that have been used by all of us to um, think about our own children, to think about the children we work with, simply have unknown reliability and vulnerability. And as you see I about the 2020 problem, um, we actually know it's inaccurate. Uh, and there's a tendency to either under-identify or over-identify children. So, uh, so what we're trying to do in universal screening is introduce some reliability and validity into the process to better identify those children with subsyndromal risk, if you will, a better cholesterol test for that matter, and then try to lower that cholesterol, lower that risk, and cut off the story. So uh, moving to the next slide, um, this is taken from a, a landmark textbook from the National Academies from 2009. Um, and uh, the book is certainly aging now. Um, and there's even more research to show that we can be effective at preventing mental health disorders. And that's really important. As you've probably read in the last decade, uh, there are some small-scale studies to show that if you treat children who are at very high genetic risk because they have one or two siblings, for example, um, with uh, autism. If, uh, if a young child without autism, uh, a sibling who has the risk is treated as if they do have autism, uh, the, the likelihood of an autism diagnosis later in development is cut substantially. So, um, so it, it hints that we can, even with some of the disorders and problems of childhood that are, um, cause the most challenges for schooling and the most challenges for community and family life, we can potentially head some of those off from ever occurring, uh, which saves countless misery and money uh, for, uh, for society. So, so that's the focus of uh, the O'Connell Boat and Water book. And that's my definition of behavioral and, and emotional risk is taken directly uh, from that work. And that's identifying the early symptoms of mental health uh, disorder or problems uh, before enough of them accumulate or before there's enough severity that we end up having to make a diagnosis, make a special education placement, and engage in more, um, uh, more um, invasive uh, more expensive uh, intervention programs, and um, more suffering on the part of children, adolescents, families, and society. So that's that's our goal. So we, um, as I said, began this work long ago. Uh, we had a chance to really test the work by creating some teacher screeners uh, first, and then later some self-report and some parent screeners. But we began most of our work with teacher screeners and then we uh, obtained a federal grant to do work in Los Angeles Unified School District on a larger scale of uh, kindergarten through middle school screening uh, of about 35 schools there. But we also did some screening in high schools um, as part of that grant. 
what we um, what we see here, for those of you who are familiar with uh, our behavior and assessment system for children, is the self-report of personality. And this is for uh, a middle schooler. And so this is the second stage in the screening process. So, so the first stage is, um, um, is universal screening with a very, very short form of 25 to 30 items that can be completed in five minutes or less. Um, this, um, this girl, uh, she took that and she got an elevated risk score. The second stage in the screening process is to uh, give a comprehensive form. And so, so we gave the BASC um, SRP um, uh, to her to really see if she indeed had risk or if her screener score was a false positive. So we followed up with her in this second stage of screening. And what we found was that she was suffering significantly uh, with an internalizing problem uh, that there were some hints of. Um, she certainly wasn't the happiest child in, in, in school. Um, and she was having trouble with school engagement. She just didn't seem motivated in school. Um, and so there were, there were some uh, concerns by the guidance counselor in middle school. Uh, parental concerns were more about school achievement than mental health status. Now it looks like um, in this second stage of screening, uh, we should engage in some intervention or some preventive intervention if she does not have a, enough symptoms or enough functional impairment that is poor school grades or special education placement. So her grades are fine. So we're not seeing significant um, um, problems there that uh, would probably qualify her for special education placement. Um, parents uh, were advised to take her for uh, an evaluation for potential private psychotherapy. Um, there may not be enough symptoms there either, but um, I'll describe to you later on some group administered preventive in, uh, preventive intervention program with our skill builder too um, that would allow us to address some of the, her internalizing needs and maybe cut them off before she needs a full referral for psychotherapy medication or something of that or a mental health diagnosis. So as you can see from this profile, it's it's a distinctly internalizing profile. This is the type of child, because of a lack of externalizing behavior problems, is very likely to, to not be referred uh, for services at school and was not referred for services out of school. So, so she's, um, she's beginning to suffer silently, and the screener picked her up. Just this isn't a aside. Um, talking to some of my colleagues uh, at LAUSD a couple of years after we were doing this work, uh, we were told that um, this sort of finding caused a, a reassignment of some of the school psychologists there. And for some of them, they were given duties to engage in preventive work, sort of preventive cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for kids like this, girls and boys, who were showing internalizing problems, uh, not particular academic problems at this point in time, um, uh, but, this, uh, but they were reassigned to engage in some prevention strategies so that hopefully they don't have to see these kids later. So, um, so universal screening, and I've heard these anecdotes from elsewhere uh, as well, also helps us rethink service delivery in some cases. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that as the presentation proceeds. So moving to the next slide, um, this is an overview of uh, the screener that we created uh, over a decade ago. Um, it was um, recreated for the VASC-2. It was re-envisioned again for the VASC-3. And so it continues to improve. This is the, the first edition uh, where uh, we've offered subscale scores. And I'll talk a bit about that. Um, but you'll see that it has fewer age ranges, fewer age divisions, and that makes it much more efficient to have uh, a parent and a teacher in a self-report or student self-report form. And, and, and uh, the student form essentially uh, doesn't start till um, third grade um, and goes through high school. So that's, that's a, uh, as you'll see on a later so slide, screening has to be incredibly cost efficient and time efficient. 
for it to receive good uptake and for it to be practical for universal screening in schools in particular. And so um, part of that effort is to create, for example, on the student self-report, single form uh, for all age levels, less than 30 items, uh, very brief, and we'll talk about scoring and other personal issues uh, later. And similarly, fewer forms for parent report and teacher report. So um, the, the scoring system is, is in Q Global. Um, you can do individual scoring. You can do targeted screening, for example. Uh, let's say that you have a child or adolescent or young adult referred to you for um, a hearing impairment, uh, an assessment associated with that, a uh, language uh, disorder. Um, any variety of uh, referrals, just poor school achievement. Uh, in, in, in addition to doing universal screening, you can also use the best because it's so short um, to do individual screening or small group screening uh, to rule out a mental health disorder. Um, and you'll see this on the later slide as well. It's basically sort of a mini mental status exam uh, to kind of rule out that possibility in a very cost-efficient and time-efficient way. So we'll talk more about that as well. Uh, and on the parent and student uh, form, uh, those are in Spanish. And we um, utilize both those forms in, in our work in Los Angeles. I'm sure some of you are already using the best. And you've used English and Spanish forms. Um, and so um, I, I get very little information um, from individuals about the Spanish translation. Um, and I usually get correspondence if there are problems with the translation. So it seems to be working pretty well. This is our third attempt at translation. So it should work better you know, with every uh, improvement made in the translation process. So that's just um, um, a screenshot of the Pearson website. So you can find all this information there. So this is the scoring uh, and interpretation. And so um, the overall score is a behavioral and emotional risk index. Um, and so that co composite score is offered for teacher parent self-report, T-score, mean of 50, and standard deviation 10. Again, we wanted to keep the learning curve low um, and make this easy to do. Um, so it's like every other T-score. And then uh, on the teacher and parent form, there's an externalizing risk index. Um, it's because um, uh, students are not as adept at reporting externalizing problems. And so this only exists on the teacher and parent form. Um, there's an internalizing risk index on all three forms. To the, but to be honest with you, we have some old research from the early 2000s that has convinced me that the student form is best for assessing internalizing risk. Uh, even though it's available, we have decent reliability for that subscale. Um, for the uh, parent and teacher form. Uh, adaptive skills index is only on the teacher and parent. Um, again, because they're better raters of kind of the full range of adaptive competencies that a child or, or youth might possess. Um, and um, there is a, a self-regulation risk, which it primarily has to deal with hyperactivity and impulsivity attention problems. So some externalizing problems not enough for us to feel confident to call it an externalizing scale. So we call it a self-regulation uh, risk index. Uh, and as you know, self-regulation is incredibly important for uh, doing well in school, at work, on campus, et cetera. And a personal adjustment risk index is the analog to adaptive skills on the uh, teacher and parent form. The adaptive skills items are very important on these screeners just as there are on other rating scales. Um, there's a practical reason. One of the practical reasons is that the reverse scoring sort of interferes with response sets. Um, and it, it causes the rater to think through their responses when you have some reverse scored item, items. But secondly, from an empirical standpoint, um, the absence of adaptive skills um, in abundant research uh, that myself, and, uh, that I've done, my students, et cetera, um, there's abundant research to show that that um, is very predictive of uh, academic outcomes and behavioral and emotional outcomes. 
Um, and, and so uh, that's important as well, particularly for school-based uh, practitioners. So uh, high score reflects more problems. Um, and these are risk levels, uh, 61 to 70 elevated risk, 71 and, and higher extreme risk or about second percentile rank. And you'll notice we all have risk. So there's not such a thing as no risk, it's normal risk. So just like not to push the metaphor to, to we all have risk for cardiac disease, um, regardless of our cholesterol level. Um, and, um, uh, and it's the same thinking here. Everybody has risk. So it's the only question is, is it normal or is it abnormal risk? So that's why that's uh, worded that way. So this is what the form looks like. Um, they're incredibly not complicated. Um, it's um, in hard copy, it's two pages. Um, and on Q Global, three pages uh, um, with ample room uh, for students to respond, teachers to respond, uh, parents to respond. Um, so they're quite uncomplicated. Uh, this is a great example of, uh, of what Cecil and I have found uh, with every sort of behavioral emotional measures we've created. If you make it simple enough, you'll find that uh, virtually no one reads the instructions. Uh, and I noticed that when I was um, uh, using it online uh, the other day again. Uh, that's a good sign. Uh, if people aren't reading the instructions, it's pretty self-explanatory. This is the output. And uh, again, the output is rather simple as well because it's just um, a screening measure. It's not, not diagnostic, uh, but you have an F index, pattern index, consistency index on the sample. The screenshot I took from the Pearson website is, as well. So um, I wanted to use materials that you have ready access to. So this is available there. Um, and then you get the overall T-score, the, um, the BER. And in this case, it's a T-score of 69 at the 96 percentile rank. And that's elevated risk. It's at the cusp of a elevated and extremely elevated risk. Most of that risk is internalizing and personal adjustment. Um, and there you just get uh, raw scores. Um, you see that for internalizing risk, it's at the top of the range with the raw score of 16. Uh, that's not the case for personal adjustment risk. So this is a, a, a perfect sample case that is not unlike many authentic cases I see where you'll You'll see elevated risk, but you'll see plenty of room for prevention, plenty of room for symptom mitigation, you know, where the, the child's pediatrician, mental health provider, school psychologist, school psychiatric social worker, guidance counselor, teacher, others um, can have some confidence that um, they can begin intervention, prevention strategies uh, with the hope of cutting this off and turning it around and getting these um, these scores. And on follow-up, uh, my goal for these scores is to basically, through mild interventions, preventive interventions, push kids back into the normal range. And, and um, this is, again, the way we, we think about our own risk um, as, uh, as adults. So um, many of you, like me, your physician will tell you pretty much regardless of what the risk you have, whether it's cardiac disease or diabetes or anything of that nature, pretty much get the same preventive strategies, um, and that is to um, eat well and exercise. Um, and similarly, you'll see for our skill builder guide, um, the, the uh, interventions are very mild and they're very generic. Uh, it's like develop social skills, develop self-regulation competencies. Uh, this is just good for all children. But um, kids with risk may not have been exposed to this sort of instruction, um, sort of social emotional learning, um, or their risk may uh, require that they have a larger dose of it. And so instead of just getting informally in school and at home, we get a formal eight week program at school, and we can move them back to the normal risk range. So this is a very hopeful. Uh, reasons uh, particular child. And as I said, I've seen many of those. 
There's a multi-rater report um, if you want a parental view of um, their child's risk, plus a student view or a teacher view, plus a student view, et cetera. Um, so that's available on QGlobal as well. And then a group administration for groups of 20 or 30 or 50 or so kids for more widespread, unit, widespread universal screening is available in uh, QGlobal, uh, but also in review 360, uh, if you happen to use that for rostering purposes. Moving to the next slide, uh, false positives, true positives, et cetera. This is uh, kind of a technical topic, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. But our greatest fear here, as you see on this slide, is false negatives. This is what we want to avoid. We don't want to miss people in, with the disorder, uh, whether it's you know, the testing we're talking now, about now with COVID-19 or um, PSA tests or breast exams for, um, uh, for breast cancer. I mean, for any sort of exam that we're engaged in, we're, we want to avoid false negatives, and that is missing a disorder that's there. So the best is designed the same way. It's designed to minimize false negatives, to have those less than 1% or less than 2%, um, preferably. Um, but there's a trade-off for that, and that means you have to have a few more false positives. So you want to let more kids in in the first gate and then screen them out in the second gate. So this is why in a gated scheme, uh, screening approach that Hill Walker's been doing for decades and others have been doing for a long time, there's always a second gate. And the second gate, to make it a interpersonal mental status exam, we don't want to make it a full psychological evaluation. We don't want to engage in something really time consuming and expensive. And this is why uh, we you know, work in LA and some of you are probably doing the same thing, are following up with a full rating scale. Um, and if the full rating scale has no T-scores above 60, you know, um, then you can say with some confidence, this falls in that upper right-hand quadrant here. This is a false positive. And since it's a false positive, um, we can uh, let them triage them out of the system as not having enough risk to be addressed at this point in time. Um, so... Um, so we're trying to, uh, we want to make sure we don't miss anyone, you know, with impending schizophrenia or with uh, diagnosable depression. You know, we can't afford to miss those kids because it's potentially dangerous to themselves or others. So we don't, we don't want to miss disorders. And so we want to minimize the false negatives by adding in a few extra false positives. And when you add in those extra false positives, that's when you have to have that second gate um, to, to rule them out. Um, last time I, I was in, involved in some of this data collection um, at a high school, um, I uh, went by the, the high school in the San Fernando Valley uh, for a day and brought kids with positive screens into a room, and I just proctored them in the room, um, completing the, um, a VASC SRP, full-length SRP due to the second gate screen. So that can be done in groups. Uh, as well, uh, certainly a teacher can proctor that, but I wanted to do it myself because I wanted um, more experience with, uh, with second grade, second gate, excuse me, universal screening. Um, and it was really interesting. Uh, what was interesting about it was um, how disconcerting it was to me to see 30 some kids in this room filling, filling out the full SRP and how many of those kids actually sort of appeared to have internalizing problems. They appeared to me maybe timid, maybe sad, you know, but um, the room was not full of kids with externalizing problems. I had been in a room like that full of so many kids that looked like they had internalizing risk, maybe even internalizing disorder, or were just timid and there's nothing wrong with them whatsoever. And, and this was a false positive on the screen. So that's the that's the trade-off between false negatives and false positives, and uh, we'll talk more in much greater detail about that. So here's a study uh, that we did when I was uh, dean at Georgia State University. Um, 
07, 012, and, and that particular range. And so uh, these are some of my colleagues, um, uh, former students, uh, Cornell and Amy uh, and Lee, who's on, uh, on the faculty at the University of Memphis now. And so, and Catherine, so uh, what we did here was uh, uh, a screener at some um, middle and uh, high schools, about 12 of them you see circled by myself there. Um, and um, so this was widespread screening with thousands of kids. And this was done with the student self-report. Uh, because that's the most practical, uh, because it's the least intrusive on teacher time. Um, it's also uh, non-intrusive, essentially, on student instructional time, uh, because whether you um, do this remotely, whether you gather students in a computer um, instructional room to do this uh, online, whether you have students do it with pencil and paper, that's a significant downside because the scoring is tedious after that. Um, uh, regardless of how you do it, it's it's a maximum invasion of instructional time if you do it once per year of about 45 minutes. You know, so basically a class period, a 15 minute class period. If you do it twice a year, which normally I wouldn't advise except for kids who have been identified. Um, so it's a little bit more, but if you're talking about once a year, once every other year doing screening. For example, it may be wise to do screening in kindergarten or first grade, maybe not again until third grade, maybe during a transition year, you know, um, first year middle school, uh, first year high school, you know. So it, even if it's not done, uh, if it's not done every year, then there's even less intrusion on instructional time. So, so this was done uh, one time in this particular sort of mid-sized metropolitan area uh, school system. And what you see is the ex uh, expected percentage of kids identified and uh, the right-hand uh, column there under the results section. And uh, based upon our research and the epidemiology uh, of disorders in the population at about 20% according to CDC, then we would expect you know about 20% of kids to identify themselves as having problems. And what we see is that using the self-report, it was less than that. So in this particular study, um, it was nine, 10% identified with elevated risk, with a lower level of risk, and 3% uh, with extremely elevated risk. And so uh, we'll talk about triaging, but just doing some visual triaging with you now, looking at these data, those 3%, 99% um, of those 3%, are going to be known to the school system because they're in special education. They're being assessed because they're referred for special education eligibility. They're getting private psychiatric care outside of school. Um, uh, a guidance counselor at the high school has expressed worry about them and has sort of wrapped their arms around them and put them in a group intervention, social skills development group or um, trauma-informed care group or something of that nature. So, um, so those kids are probably getting services. It's the nine and a half percent out of this group where uh, uh, it's important to do second stage screening. That is uh, uh, in some cost efficient way. And I just used a rating scale to do that. Um, so that's uh, 4,000 kids. Uh, so 430 um, uh, require the second stage um, screening. What you'll find in the second stage is that a large number of those kids, maybe half, third to a half, are already being served by the system as well. And so that then 420 will get smaller because several of those kids are receiving services. Some are false positives. And then that leaves you with a much smaller group of children that might benefit, benefit from a less intensive um, intervention. So that's the a, a preview of triaging. Uh, what are the effects of screening? Um, uh, several potentially uh, inter interesting effects. Um, there's much more that we need to learn about this. I was reading the literature last night about this. Um, 
there's still many unknowns. Um, but we found in, in an early study, for example, and as you know, there's grave concern about disproportionate referral of boys, particularly boys of color, for example, um, and disproportionate placement, uh, potentially. So, um, so Aaron Dowdy and, um, and Bridget and, uh, and Katie Eklund, et cetera, uh, did a study back in 2011, and it was a very clever, unusual study because they had teachers identify um, um, children with risk using nominate so an informal teacher's best judgment mechanism. Um, and then they had and then they had these same teachers fill out the uh, previous edition of the best teacher rating form on these same kids. And, and so uh, what uh, happened there is that the, the qualitative nomination process identified more boys, than the rating scale process, even though it's the same person, which is interesting. So, um, so I think there might be something about the form, completing a rating scale form, that um, engenders more reliability and validity, because we do have more reliability and validity evidence for the form. Um, and with more reliability and validity, it may mitigate some potential unconscious biases. For example, so it's an interesting finding I want you to be aware of, because adoption of universal screening has the potential to sort of change the referral population a bit. Um, you may see fewer boys, you may see more girls, you may see more internalizers. For example, because the the screener, and and we do have a number of um, bias studies of the screener showing. Um, you know, it's relatively bias-free. Um, and, and so the screener may uh, control some biases that go into referral, informal referral processes. Um, if, if this is borne out by abundant other research studies, um, that's a really good finding, I think. So I want to make you aware of the different approaches to screening informal versus uh, assessment, formal assessment, and how it can produce different results. And those might be lawful. Which screener might you use? Which one would you prefer? Well, I've already telegraphed uh, my bias in this regard. Um, and my bias um, is to use the student self-report um, uh, for a variety of reasons. It picks up internalizing problems, I think, better than parent or teacher report, because we have an old study showing that children and their peers are better at identifying internalizing problems than teacher and parent ratings of, of these same children. So, um, so I have more and more confidence in student self report ratings, particularly for internalizing problems. Secondly, um, it's minimally invasive on staff time at schools. And um, with the abundant pressures that teachers are working under these days, we need to be very protective of staff time and does a good job of that. Thirdly, as you see in this graph in this small scale study um, reported in the previous edition, these are, uh, uh, this is a four year longitudinal study and what you see is that the student and teacher screeners are the best predictors of four year GPA or GPA four year study. Um, so, um, so there's some evidence validity evidence, there's more validity evidence that say the teachers and the students are easier to access certainly as well. If you're going to screen an entire grade level, for example, or multiple grade levels in a given year, or multiple schools as we did in that study. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, in one of the reasons for my preference for student self-report screening. So let's talk about some of the practicalities should you decide to use the best or a different form uh, in a universal screening process this year. It, I was fascinated to learn um, that screening is very old. Um, and the, the California Department of Education was doing this in the early 1960s. I had no idea. Um, and so I found this old study from uh, Cohen and uh, 
73 reporting on those early results. And they were using, they were experimenting with teacher screeners um, in the 50s and the 60s. They had uh, some good data. In fact, uh, those data were used to identify the five areas uh, of the most severe emotional disturbance that we see in uh, federal education law, which is really interesting to me. Um, so it's an old practice. And what that means is that um, many mistakes have been known, have been uh, made. We know what those are, and let's not repeat them. So we tried to learn uh, from the past. Um, and as uh, Cohen says, they have to be simple, clear, easy to understand, objective, and relatable to educational values. And so having, for example, a lot of psychoticism items, like we have on our atypicality scale, would probably be inappropriate for a screener. Um, we have one or two, um, but we, we don't have lots of those items. Because again, we're just trying to get a sense for risk and early indications of disorder. The second stage will help guide that decision making further. But if you have a lot of, shall we say, weird items um, that would make teachers uncomfortable answering, for example, or students uncomfortable, then there's no use creating a screen uh, because it will be discarded. It will not be taken seriously. So, so we tried to uh, select items for the screener that had broad symptom coverage, because we're interested in early symptoms of disorders as broad coverage, but we picked items that uh, hopefully would um, be not as offensive or not as disconcerting or disturbing to the readers so that the screening can actually take place and, and be practical. And there's a pediatric screening um, study there um, also on the slide. And that study uh, is interesting because it compares the costs of screening. And uh, a nurse doing this one-on-one -on -one with a parent, um, you know, asking questions about um, their child in um, a pediatric uh, well-child visit is just expensive. And, and so what we've tried to do is to control the personnel costs because um, that's that's far and away the, the largest cost of screening. So regardless of the universal screener you might select, just think about personnel costs, which is why I advise against hand scoring uh, for large numbers of kids. What sort of assessment, uh, what sort of, um, excuse me, uh, assent, <laughs> permission and assent is, is required? Um, and this is the adaptation of the Spanish form that we used in uh, for the research in LA. Um, and um, uh, I'd be interested to, to hear your thoughts about this, um, but uh, our, as we've practiced in different schools, um, my students, postdocs, et cetera, um, the, the old term for this is passive parental consent, the more modern term is term is opt-out assessment. Uh, opt-out assessment seems to be more prevalent. Um, so we, uh, we've we been using this, and uh, again, I'd, I'd like to hear your experiences as well, but so long as the parents are pull, fully informed, and so this would go home in the uh, pre-opening of school communication to parents to make sure that all parents would get it. It would go home in multiple languages, depending upon the context, to make sure parents have access to it. And uh, this included a phone number, encouraged uh, calls or communication uh, with the school to, um, to answer questions. So um, in, in this case, um, one of our, uh, our doctoral students was uh, bilingual, and so she fielded the questions from uh, parents in, in Spanish. And, um, and the question is, how many calls can you expect asking what this form is about? Um, it's a different context, so who knows these days? I can't give you current data, but about a decade ago, um, we, uh, she would field out of the high school of a thousand kids, um, um, less than five calls from parents um, and explaining the content, and, et cetera. So, so long as this is highly visible, it provides opportunities. Uh, the, the written message could be reinforced in uh, the first uh, 
parent meeting of the school year. I know this is different time now, so I don't know how you know, that's going to be a very different phenomena, but just um, excessive communication, as much communication as possible so that parents have the opportunity to opt out is important. Secondly, on the, since um, I favor the self-report, uh, we um, had a form for uh, students to fill out uh, that could be done online, it could be done live, um, uh, or at least the student asked for their assent as well. With those two approaches, um, the participation rate was always extremely high. Uh, we only had trouble in one school district that required um, written consent. Um, and this was a very uh, high socioeconomic status school district, very kind of a legendary good school district. And results were odd. Um, so they, they were odd because um, the prevalency rate of risk was so high. And so we, we don't know if it was the parents who suspected their kids had problems that gave us permission, but it, it, um, it just felt like we didn't get a sampling um, of, of grade levels and a representation of the grade levels. So, um, so I don't know how much bias that built into the screen, but we think it may have added some to the screen. So what might uh, secondary prevention? So primary prevention would be social emotional learning offered by teachers in a regular classroom setting, for example. Secondary prevention would be um, identifying kids at the second gate, assigning them to um, a small group of about eight to 12 kids who uh, participate in an eight week uh, group intervention, not unlike a social skills group. And we had these groups run by a teacher who loved doing this sort of secondary prevention, social emotional learning work, um, guidance counselor, psychiatric social worker, um, the primary providers, tool psych in some cases. Um, but the, the school psychs tend to take more charge over the assessment process, and then other providers tend to have more interest or take more charge over the group administration, I'm sorry, the group preventive intervention part, um, especially counseling uh, counselors. Um, uh, this is right in their wheelhouse, uh, doing this sort of work. So at a high school with about 100 kids, um, if you had 1,000 uh, kids, if you identify 100, and um, several of those are false positives, several of those are already in, um, in the system somehow, and you're left with about 50 kids. Uh, at that high school, that's about five groups for eight weeks. Uh, essentially, is how that, how that would work out, meeting once a week. We anticipated this need, um, and so this is this could be before you even get to a pre-referral team. And, and we did some of this work before engaging a pre-referral team. Uh, we engaged some people on that team to be providers of the group, uh, but it was not a formal referral process or pre-referral intervention for that matter. So you know, that's awkwardly said. Um, but um, we, uh, we found that this is kind of a tier one and a half service, if you will. If you, if you don't engage a pre-referral intervention team, uh, we would get separate permission to have kids participate in the eight-week group. And for us, it was more like tier one and a half. Um, so we created the skill builder too for this purpose. You can see here there are eight lessons. Uh, one of the important group expectations is uh, privacy, you know, um, helping the kids understand that there might be things said in this group. Um, that uh, it would be less than tactful to share outside group. Uh, but it's not a therapy group. It's very much instructional. And there's a script. And Kimberly Van Est, uh, co-author who led this work, basically wrote these eight sessions as lesson plans so that a teacher who just loves social emotional learning can dive in deeper and do more of it. Or a uh, special educator can do more of it potentially you know, a parent volunteer with some of uh, these sorts of skills could do some of this work. 
anyone who enjoys kids, enjoys groups of kids, and enjoys watching kids grow. Uh, in this case, in the social emotional realm, can do this work. Um, so there, here's the second session. Here's an example of listening uh, effectively on the next slide. Um, and uh, again, for those of you who are a teacher, you know, I was certainly trained as a classroom teacher as well, uh, you'll see that this looks very much like a, uh, a lesson plan. So it should be familiar. Again, the logic here is to not require any professional development of anyone. Um, the logic is, is like for the student or teacher completing the form, you want it to be self-explanatory. So, so uh, although you might in, wish to engage in uh, training or some co-training with individuals as you launch universal screening, for example, um, you should be able to pick it up. You know, if you understand the basics of assessment, the basics of instruction, you should be able to pick it up. And that's, that's the design here. Um, so it uh, gives you the duration, uh, the materials, um, learning objectives, and then the procedure. Uh, and then in the next slide, you see the seven um, steps uh, for engaging in effective listening. And again, this is um, a universally important skill to have. You know, for all of us, because I'm quite sure that I don't maintain good eye contact in some conversations. I probably don't think about my posture, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, um, so it's like exercise for the physical part. You know, this is like life skills, but more direct instruction of life skills than one might typically receive in the regular education curriculum or might quickly receive in the home environment. And so there are kids, there are adults you know, that, that need this uh, direct instruction. So kind of another way of saying, you know, this just isn't uh, really high-minded research work here. Uh, um, people should be able to pick this up and teach these skills. And it'd be very gratifying actually to watch kids pick up these skills. So that's the eight weeks. How effective is it? We really don't know. We just had this small pilot study again you know, when I was dean at Georgia State, just when we were doing the work. Um, Jackie Biallo, um, last PhD student who's working, trying to finish her degree there, uh, led this work in, in Los Angeles. And you see here um, that I, I highlighted for you is that um, you know, what we saw was for the 50, about 46 or so kids who were in these groups led by a variety of professionals that went lesson uh, sequence. Um, you know, we gave them a screener at the end of that sequence. We gave them the best student support again to see what happened. And what we see is about 32% of the kids moved from the risk range to the, non, uh, to the normal risk range. And that's fantastic certainly imperfect. But that statistic hides um, the other two bars there you see, where for kids with internalizing risk, they really benefited from this sort of focused social skills, competency training, um, social skills and learning skills for that matter. And, and, and that's great. So two thirds of those kids responded favorably to this, which is actually quite consistent with child psychotherapy, child uh, psychotherapy literature for kids with internalizing problems, especially anxiety disorders. Um, they tend to be quite amenable to uh, psychotherapy, for example. So we see some a similar phenomenon here, and that's wonderful. The externalizing kids, about a quarter of them moved into normal risk range. So, um, so these are some findings, um, uh, small sample, statistically significant, not well controlled, we would have a control sample, for example, getting the placebo. Um, but we need more research on this. Um, um, but this is the, this is essentially the, the concept that we have in mind here. It's not proof of concept, it's suggestion of the concept at best. Um, so these kids finish the eight week session and then the question is, what do you do? Um, well, uh, some schools uh, report to me they've decided to put kids who didn't respond well into a second eight-week session to see if it would take. 
For others, they move to formal referral to the pre-referral intervention team uh, for individualized uh, interventions and then tracking those for their efficacy. Um, for um, uh, some school districts, um, they've enjoyed these group uh, groups so much that they've wanted kids in, in already identified for special education to get into these groups as well. We have no idea if they efficacy uh, for those kids. So uh, so there's some experimentation that can occur here, uh, but if, if this um, these data play out, then what, what should happen is that your kids with mild risk, risk um, should get, that group should get smaller, particularly those kids with internalizing risk, um, and the kids with externalizing risk might require more assertive interventions uh, to move into the normal risk range. So that's the story there. If you're looking to triage which kids should get in the groups first, um, your extremely elevated risk kids, that very small group of, that has not been identified, and, and that's a really small group out of a thousand students in a high school, that should be five or 10, and that should be a small group of kids might get priority for the group. Um, uh, but what we did was uh, every kid 61 and above who was a true positive um, was uh, and was not previously identified for any uh, service were included in this group and that's how we ended up with about 46. This is uh, progress monitoring uh, and this is uh, output from the BASC uh, Flex Monitor and so if you, if you want to track these kids with more individualized interventions or kids with group interventions and wanted to assess progress mid-group, end of group, you have know, the Flex Monitor at your disposal, which does a nice job of graphing results over time like this, um, and compares items over time. Um, and we have pre-packaged uh, forms of the Flex Monitor, if you don't want to design your own. They're amazingly brief for progress monitoring for individual cases or groups eight items, 14 items, and the reliabilities are uh, surprisingly good. I didn't expect them to be this good for that small a number of items, but they're 80s, 90s, uh, really impressive with one or a few in the 70s. Social emotional learning curriculum in the same um, vast skill building guide, which you find at Pearson on the intervention materials website. Um, it's not the behavioral intervention guide. It's the social, uh, the fast skill builder guide. Um, this is the one that's designed for classroom teachers. And so I showed you the eight week uh, program there for kids identified as true positives. But there's also a tier one social emotional learning curriculum there. And what you see here is it uh, is designed around three areas of, of focus, respect, problem solving, cooperation. Um, and so it's, it's aligned with some of the major standards for social emotional learning. And this, um, this slide of, uh, about the objectives show how they relate to various problem uh, behaviors and preventing problem behaviors or disorders uh, from uh, worsening. And this is an example of a lesson that uh, we're presuming that a teacher can pick up because it looks like a lesson plan. And it is, um, it's about respect, um, but what is clever about what Kim, um, Kimber did with this is that she's building respect and academic content at the same time. So it's a, it's a miniature zoology lesson, if you will. At the same time, kids are learning about respect. They're learning a little bit about the social aspects of um, elephant behavior. So, um, so we have uh, questions here for the entire you know, regular classroom, um, and uh, these generate discussions. Um, I don't show the remainder of the slides here, but there, um, there are other parts of this uh, unit one that kind of uh, flesh out uh, the necessity of respect, how one shows respect. Um, how important it is um, for um, all aspects of participation in school. So it's pretty well hidden within the BASC, uh, this social emotional learning curriculum. So 
the skill builder guide is pretty well hidden too, because it's not the first thing on the page when you go to the Basque intervention materials. So just look for the skill builder guide. Um, and then these two components, one and two are included uh, in there. This is a flow chart uh, for the screening process uh, that shows the uh, universal screening, uh, the second stage screening, and then that's the major decision point. And then once you get beyond that decision point, if you're shown to have risk, it shows how to proceed to try to prevent participation in tier two services. And, um, and if this kid unfortunately gets all the way to tier three services, to try to mitigate the severity of uh, problems by catching them um, as early as possible. And uh, two of my former students, uh, Megan and Bridget, wrote a book um, that summarizes the permissions process uh, false negatives, uh, false positives, and, and those sorts of issues, um, and some of the practicalities of the things we learned uh, in our IES grant. And so some of the, you know, many of those lessons learned and mistakes made are summarized uh, in this textbook by Springer. That's all. Um, thanks for joining me. Regrets for uh, speaking quickly, but I want to make sure we got the content in. Um, Maybe we have time for a few questions. Yeah, I think we do have some time for questions. Um, I can read the questions to you while the rest of you are listening in to the question and answer period of this. Um, if you'd like to type any questions into the chat, we'll try to get through as many questions as we can um, in the next uh, 18 minutes or so that we have remaining. So I'll go ahead and read the questions to you, Dr. Kamphaus, and you can answer them. Thank um, you. Yes, so the first question is that someone that had noticed caution scores on validity index for Samantha does not give, does that not give pause to the validity of results? It does not give pause. Um, the, um, the caution index, uh, particularly the F index, for example, um, is just like it is on the BASC. Um, and so uh, the caution scores indicate one or two things, potential problems with the validity of the rater. The other equally likelihood is that the child has a problem and a child has a problem with diverse symptoms. Um, so these scales are built with a sampling of items from each of the clinical scales. And so with the sampling of items from each of the clinical scales, it could mean that, uh, again, to be re redundant, uh, apologies for that, there is maybe a fake bad tendency or um, equally likely the poor kid has multiple problems like Samantha did across a variety of scales. If you have, uh, so what, what I've learned over the years by just looking at these results and having conversations with uh, groups such as this and hearing examples you know, of, of the experiences of participants on calls like this, is a very consistent trend, but it, I'm now increasingly convinced that um, uh, extreme caution on one, preferably two of those makes me worry much more. We also, uh, uh, Lee, uh, Michelle Harrell Williams now at the University of Memphis did a fantastic study on the self-report screen that we did in LA um, and, and tested um, uh, for validity problems independently of the validity index. So she went and looked at the data digitally to try to find sort of aberrant responses. The, um, the frequency of validity problems was uh, less than um, one-tenth of one percent. I mean, this minuscule. So we actually have some empirical evidence from Lee's work um, to suggest that in many of the cases we see where there are multiple elevations on multiple scales as we see from Samantha, that um, gets noticed in the validity index in indexes or in one index where uh, it's just in the caution range. So, I hope that's Thank you. 
Yes, thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on the need for screening in light of COVID-19 and how and when to administer based on whether students return to school physically or if learning is done virtually? What are your thoughts on that? No, yes, I'm getting a lot of correspondence uh, around that topic. Um, is there, uh, there are a number of researchers, for example, I conversed with them a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, that's uh, trying to determine the effect of the pandemic on mental health outcomes for kids and is using the best and best in that research. You know, uh, in school, out of school, uh, I think it's probably more important now to do universal screening. Uh, there's just a, an added ambient level of stress for adults, children, everybody right now um, and and so um, given the concern I'm hearing from people um, I would say whenever you have an opportunity whenever you feel you're ready um, in, engage in some sort of early detection to try to mitigate this risk and tamp it down and keep it within normal limits one of my hypotheses, because some uh, one of our colleagues at Columbia did research post 9-11, and he did pre and post tests using fast teacher ratings on kids in the elementary school closest to the Twin Towers. And, and what, what you might also see is um, resilience on the part of kids as well. So we, we might find some kids with some risk right now that have spooky clean histories, so to speak, and uh, parents don't suspect anything, teachers don't expect anything, but they're, they have internalizing risk of you know, 61 or 65 or something like that. There might be some kids like this where you would choose a wait and see attitude. Um, and again, that's much like my intern is saying, you know, the cholesterol is getting high, it's not high enough for the statin. I'm going to wait until the next six month exam before you know, we consider doing that. So that's another possible outcome is wait and see and um, target a few children for individual um, screening follow up um, in January, for example, or next spring, for example, is, is another possible outcome of this. But um, I, I would sadly, we need to screen early and often like that right now. So along those lines, it, there was a question about, do you anticipate an increased request for screening due to COVID-19? So can you elaborate on that part just a little bit more on, on what kind of um, increase you would expect to see and where those requests will be coming from? Well, I, I know from my field, they're coming from higher education. Um, just grave concern about college student mental health. And I see this in my individual uh, interactions uh, with college students. And uh, we have we have international students, for example, uh, who are studying here. Some of these may be studying in some of your high schools and they can't go home. Um, and uh, they're expressing a great deal of stress. Um, so I, I know we're getting demands from this in higher education. Um, when I was reviewing the literature the other night, there's a body of research coming out of Korea uh, screening done in higher education there because of concern about just the high level of internalizing problems being experienced by college students internationally now. Um, and uh, certainly I'm, I'm hearing from colleagues in school districts uh, around the country about what they're doing. So yesterday I was talking with a, a colleague and you know they're trying to, they uh, statewide they're going to institute screening universal screening for the mental health risk and they're trying to figure out how they're going to do it. Um, but they're going to do it this fall uh, because it's a mandate in the state. So, um, so I'm seeing more momentum toward early detection and prevention now than, than I've ever seen. So we're almost to the point now where if a school district, for example, who is not looking, doesn't have some sort of mechanism for early detection that's, that's almost the exception, and that's a first. It hasn't been that way for decades. Now, now that's more like, you might be more likely to get questions from like, why aren't you screening? You know, because I hear they're doing it over here. So it's a major uh, change that uh, that I haven't seen in my 
40 years ago in this world. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is for school districts with teachers delivering remote learning, what would you recommend uh, the parent and self, would you recommend the parent and self report over a teacher report? Would a teacher delivering remote instruction be able to validly complete the best screener? I think that's wise. Um, I would recommend parent and student report in that case too. They'll, they will validly, I'm trying to use the term validly, but they will validly, they'll give you a valid, valid result. It just won't be very informative. I mean, they'll tell you what they know, but since they haven't seen the child in a long time, it won't, they won't know much, <laughs> you know, is, um, so, so their validity index may be fine. It's just that they're less well informed. And, and we've seen this over and over. So for example, when I get ratings of parents in a private practice setting, for example, they can be far more, show far, far more symptomatology than teacher ratings. Uh, because the parents made the referral, the parents have the concern. There's more concern than there is at school for that matter. And so um, and so it really depends on the context. And I think you're exactly right and that's very wise. The parents are now having the daily interaction uh, with the child um, and the child is dealing with the stresses of not seeing schoolmates, et cetera. So, so that would make sense because those two raters would be better informed about their own status than the teacher. Thank you. Um, there was another question about how these tools can be used remotely. So anything you can share on how these tools will look if and when schools have to provide remote learning, especially for a more extended period of time. What does that look like with using these tools remotely? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I guess uh, one thing my faculty would probably say is that even a dean can do it. Um, so there's a pretty low bar there. Um, but um, this is um, one of the reasons why I, um, I wanted to participate in this is because um, it's, it's one aspect of assessment that we can do at this point in time um, because we're stuck in some other areas you know, without the face-to-face -face contact. And, and I know on campus, you're trying really hard to engage in telehealth services, speech pathology services, et cetera. It's working. Uh, in many cases, it's working. Um, but uh, particularly with psychological services or psychoeducational services, we have a smaller tool set at this point in time. So any tool that can give us a remote window into <clears throat> that child and their function um, outside school at this point in time is valuable these screeners uh, fall into that um, bucket. They, you know, they were designed uh, for that purpose long before the pandemic. Um, and so um, there have even been some, you know, private practitioners that have come to our uh, attention lately who are, who are doing this work uh, highly successful and showing increasing demand for this. Um, and so it's, um, it seems to be the the, the need is greatest at this point in time. There are other sorts of assessments that are really hard for us to engage in. Um, the psychological, psychoeducational realm using rating scales is one of the few where we have sort of long-term proof of concept uh, sending these out remotely and having them be self-explanatory and easy to fill out. Great. Yeah, there were a couple of other questions on that topic as well. Um, and I know we do the computer-based administration, both on Q Global and on Review 360 for um, the best. Um, additional forms are being added to Review 360. Um, but on Q Global, you can definitely do remote administration. You can also do group administration. Um, and, and I think that would even work well in a distant setting where you could provide the links to the students completing the form um, and they could complete that on their on their own, um, as well as you can send it out remote administration for a teacher to fill it out. Um, and, and they can do that as well. Um, there was a question about since the norms are pre-COVID-19, how do you feel the norms will relate to post-school closure? 
Yeah, they're intended to be general school sample norms. And so uh, the, the norms will be stable. What you might see is more psychopathology uh, because of the current situation. Or you may not, it's hard to say. Um, but um, uh, the interesting thing about these norms is that there's no Flynn effect like there is in, with uh, cognitive test norms, uh, for example. So the Flynn effect is well known, uh, well known, and you have to revise norms every 10 years. We also know that there are bigger uh, racial group differences, for example, on cognitive tests. Uh, rating scale tests uh, such as the BASC and the BESS uh, don't have those characteristics. So when we renorm the BESS 2 and the BESS 3 and we compare the common items, there are very few differences, even though um, you know there was a decade-long change, the, the Great Recession, there were many changes uh, that occurred. Um, and the, the racial ethnic group differences are much smaller uh, on these measures as well. So, um, so they're very different from cognitive measures. And the norms, I think, are more stable, less changed over um, what we've seen is three decades, basically, of uh, quite a bit of stability. So, um, so overall in the population, the norms will you know, reflect the population averages. But if you're working in an area which has been really hard hit by you know, something, um, some risk factor, then um, the norms that, uh, should reflect a greater prevalence rate of depression, for example, or anxiety, for example. Uh, so we've, we've heard this report from some highly selective schools that are very, very competitive, where instead of your average achievement test scores being around 100 in the school, they're around 120. So there's um, some of these really high achieving uh, sort of private academies, many of them, I've heard many psychologists report over the years, at, at a much higher rate of internalizing symptomatology just because of the pressures there. So uh, depending on the pressures of the pandemic, we, depending on the pressures associated with racism, um, there we could see higher prevalence rates. The norms should be fine. Great, I know we only have about two minutes left, but there's one other question I'd like to ask. They, there's a question about different lesson plans for developmental levels. Do, do those exist for elementary versus high school student lessons? They don't. Uh, they're designed primarily for uh, elementary through middle school, but you'll see they have a big age range. Uh, if you look at that elephant example, uh, they're quite basic. Um, so. So it's like uh, the screeners are designed for a very broad age range. Um, I've not tried it with kindergartners or first graders. I don't know. Uh, but um, everything else on the desk has been designed for sort of a third grade, second grade readability index. From there on up through high school, it should be fun. All right. I know we're um, we have about one minute remaining. Um, there was a lot of good questions. If you didn't get an answer to your question, uh, we will be able to follow up with you via email. Um, so certainly, um, if you're if you're waiting for an answer, we'll do our best to to circle back with you. Thank you, everyone, um, for joining today. Thank you, um, Dr. Campos, for sharing all this information with people. Um, we really appreciate it. I wish everyone well. Thank you. Bye.